Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. I mean, if you've been listening to this podcast a while, you know our guest. We have Monica back on the podcast to give us an update on what she's been up to over over a year since we last had her on. And, you know, everyone right now, I'm still a little... I'm still a little sweaty right now. I was watching the Vikings Packers game and you know the Vikings won, thank God, because you know, the Vikings could go two and fifteen this whole year, and as long as they beat the Packers twice, you know, I'm I am satisfied with that. So at least there's that, because there's nothing that I hate more than a Packer fan. I mean, there have been some guests on the podcast that I know are Packer fans that I've had to swallow my pride, and those have been the hardest podcasts I've ever have to had to do. But before we get into all that, I mean, Monica, thank you so much for coming back on. Oh, thank you. And well, you're talking about Vikings Packers. Well, what about Vikings Cowboys? Uh, or maybe I should not say anything. I will keep my mouth shut, you know, but I, I, I'm i sorry. I just had to put oh, that Oh, no. Here. So here's the thing. So my dad and my mom went to Dallas for their vacation like three years ago, and they did, took a tour of Jerry's World. They have a photo of the Hail Mary play where, I'm sorry, the dude pushed off. I don't care what anyone says. That should have been a pet. That should have been an offensive passer. And even the guy made fun of him for that because he knew that they were from Minnesota. But, yeah, Cowboys, they're, they're having a good year. I'm going to give them props. And they always find a way to beat the Vikings, even with their backup quarterback, and that's Hey, that's the Minnesota way. It's like it's uh, there been the there been the analogy. It's like punching yourself in your private areas repeatedly and still expecting a different result. That's what being a Minnesota sports well, fan is like. So you know, I'll tell you what, because my son actually drove up with his girlfriend and his girlfriend's brother up to Minnesota specifically to see that cowboy pack uh, cowboy Viking game. And because his girlfriend's brother is a huge Viking fan. So it was, and then when they found out that Dax wasn't even going to play, they're like, oh my gosh. But, you know, it's it's one of those things that happened. It allowed him to go up there and see your beautiful state. And, you know, it it was an interesting game. It was a real, that was At least he game. came here when it's nice out, okay? Come, come here in a month and then tell me what you really think about this place. But I know your husband, isn't your husband from Iowa? He is. Good memory. He is from Iowa. So they went up through there and, you know, it, it's been a while since I've been back to Iowa. Love, you know, it's, it's funny. I think when, when you're a kid and you grow up there, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't wait to get out. But as an adult going back, you know, the, the greenery, the beauty, you know, the, there's a lot to be said for, for the Midwest and its beauty too. We don't, we don't have all that greenery here in Texas. And I remember years ago when we moved from Scotland, my kids were little and they looked at the grass and they said, mommy, what's that toy grass there? Because we'd moved from Scotland and Northern Ireland where things are very green. And I said, no, that's not toy grass. That's not fake grass. That's the real thing. It's brown in Texas. Well, I, so just a little tangent here. So I do, I do some random Google searches. Like I know about the thing about Scotland that really shocked me is that the Scottish Highlands are like the most sparsely populated place almost in, in at least in all of Europe they are where it's like there's only like 600,000 people living in a living in an area that's massive when you think of the UK of like 60 million people living in a state that's basically the size of Florida but then you have the highlands where there's like barely anyone living there so I've always wanted to go and that's visit yep well yeah the <laughs> sheep definitely outnumber the people there I, I will give them that but you know yeah I've always wanted to go and visit there and you know that's definitely on a bucket list thing for me and uh, Northern Ireland too and just Ireland in general yeah I've always wanted to always wanted to you go should. there but yeah, it is beautiful. You know, it's green for a reason, but it is beautiful there after living there for about, oh, gosh, in Northern Ireland for five years, then in Scotland for eight years. There are a few things I said I'd never complain about anymore. One was the weather. One was the gas prices. And, you know, th those are a couple of the things that it's it's a shame. And like I said, it is green for a reason. And that's because it rains a lot. And if you're lucky, it's still in the 50s in the summer and you might get a 10 day beautiful weather summer and everybody's outside tanning for eight hours straight and then everybody has to go to the hospital with first second third degree burns yep. just the way it is did, did you pick up any gaelic when you were there i think it, it was very very interesting because when i was over there i was having all my kids so not that I picked up the Gaelic as much as all the mannerisms and all the, you know, the, the pram as opposed to the, and, and the cot and, you know, the, the bin and the, the rubbish and all the kinds of words that you would say. And even I started sing-songing with my accent to where I'd come back here to the States and like, are you Canadian? Are you from somewhere else? No, but it's it's amazing how you get into that. It was a wonderful time. Love it. So if you get a chance to go, you need Are to Are your kids technically dual citizens then? 
actually the first two are triple citizens because they were born in Northern Ireland. So the UK claims them, Ireland claims them, and they're American. Okay. The two youngest ones were born in Scotland. So, and my son is one of them. So he has the right to wear a kilt. Ooh, yep. That's right. I've had one Scottish guest on the podcast and it was the greatest thing ever. Just that accent, just, oh my God. I, I almost need to do subtitles, but hey, it was well worth it because it's just... And I, I and then like her boyfriend came on too for a second because he had just the most pronounced thing ever where it was highly unintelligible. But hey, I I, I love talk <laughs> I love talking to him. But I mean, you've been very busy this last year with the Natural Olympian. I mean, you just recently judged a, a show yesterday, and you know I did. We yeah. see that you have your Hall of Fame ring with you. And what has this last year been like for you? You know, it's it's been an incredible year. I I think the the year last time I was with you was September of 2020, I think. And you know, we've just been going over everything that that COVID had had dealt us. Um, I think we're still dealing now with a lot of that. It's it's been an incredible year, I think, for those in the fitness industry, for those who are bodybuilders. Last year. Uh, thank goodness there were certain shows that did go ahead, even though, you know, you couldn't get people together, you couldn't get the countries, everybody was, you know, all masked up. This year, we've learned to adapt, to pivot, to to do whatever we needed to do in order to get the training, to have those shows. And I think it's it's been a great, great thing just, just to be able to do. I've been hugely busy. Last time I talked to you, I had just had knee surgery. I hadn't had foot surgery yet. Um, after about 11 years of competing, I had what's called a hallux rigidus. So it was really, really difficult to get into those heels. So that's one of the reasons why I decided, okay, got my hall of fame ring, um, had, had been a champion in, in certain, I, I'd done a lot of the things I really wanted to accomplish in bodybuilding. I am certainly not done with it, but it was the perfect time to take a sabbatical for a while, get a few of these things fixed. Um, it's been a year now since my foot surgery. And although it's doing absolutely great, it's still not a hundred percent. And I can't quite get into those high competition heels. So hopefully within the next couple of years that will come, but you know, there's, there's that side of it. I was super, super psyched. I um, promoted on behalf of the INBA, PNBA, the Mr. Miss USA back in July. It was over the July 4th weekend. Can't wait. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on, too. And we're going to be doing it again next year. Uh, it's been great to to take that time even to do some coaching. I have, you know, I started coaching about five or six years ago. And have taken it slowly, slowly, and now more, especially since I've taken that sabbatical from competing, it's really nice to have those, you know, I, the clients that I get, I think are are the best clients ever because they're, they're from all sorts of walks of life. They're, some of them want to compete. Some of them just want to get healthier. So I have an example. A good friend of mine from the days that I used to uh, be in television, and we worked together at Univision many of about 30 years ago. And during that 2020, during COVID, she said, she found me, she said, Monica, I want to get my health in order. She was going to turn 60 years old. She said, I want to lose some weight. Um, she had issues with certain depression and, and other uh, health issues. And so we just started, had nothing to do with competition. We just started getting her health back into order. After about eight months, she found out I was doing this show. I was promoting the show. And one of the categories that we have is called Body Quest. And it has to do with transformations. And you may not be where you want to be, but you're on that journey. And she had lost 50 pounds as it was since we first met. She was off many of her medications. She was doing things that, you know, she never thought that she could and said, I want to compete in that show. And she did. And she did amazingly well. And, you know, I, I love her dearly. But those are some of the, you know, the stories and the kind of things that, that you can be a part of. It's not just, you know, the figure, the physique, the bodybuilding, training those for those kind of competitions. But it's also about that, that health aspect. And, you know, I always talk about being fit for your purpose, whatever that purpose might be. And that's been a, a really fun thing to be able to do. And now getting into promoting, judging, I judge for several different federations, uh, natural federations. 
which is wonderful because it allows you to um, sort of mold and shape what the future is for that natural bodybuilding platform. So it's it's been great. Well, and I mean, before we get into the natural thing, I just want to get your opinion because, I mean, we've talked a lot. We talked a lot about it last time and I think a little bit at the time before about, you know, just some of the extremes that happen in this sport. And this year has been such an eye-opening year for so many people with, you know, the deaths that have been happening and just, you know, everyone's been more aware of, I think, I mean, obviously I knew about it and if you compete, you know about it, but the general public, I think has been made more aware just of all these sudden deaths that have happening of the extremes that have been taking place, you know, in the sport for a while now, but they're just finally coming to light. What has your reaction been like to just this last year in general, because it's just been such a, I think sort of a watershed moment where people are finally sort of, sort of realizing, you know, like, Hey, we need to change some things. No, I, I 100% agree with you. And, and where I come into it and where I think it's very sad and I get mad is when people come out and say, bodybuilding is not a healthy sport. And you know what? It depends on how you do it because those who are saying, and, and it's true when you are an I respect those who take whatever it is they need to do to look the way they do. They do as much or more of the work than any of us do. So we all put in the work. We all have the nutrition side. Some of us just go ahead and maybe might take a little something extra that allows us to get to a different level. And as long as you're going into that with your eyes wide open and you know what the risks are to your health, or if you want to have a family or anything like that, that's absolutely fine. But when sometimes you'll hear people saying, because it's true, anything that is too much goes into its opposite. So there are women that will start losing their hair. They will start growing hair in places where they're not supposed to. Um, and, and, that, and that's just a very small, there's so many health risks and health issues that go along with steroids, growth hormone, um, certain fat burners or so. So that is something that to me is very sad. I'm in it for the longevity. I, you know, I, I've told you, I've said that I'll probably come back in 2025. I don't know if I'll be able to last as long as that, but that's when I turned 60. And to me, that is when I have something to prove to myself. This past weekend at the Olympia, I saw 70 year olds older than that even, just blowing my mind away with their physique, but not just with their physique, but with their health and the longevity and being able to do it. And that's what happens when you do things naturally, when, when this becomes a lifestyle. Does it take longer to put that muscle on, to get that hardness? Yes, of course it does. And, and that's why usually when I talk to young athletes, be at your age, a little bit younger or even older, I say, you know what, see what you can do, what your body can do first on its own. It, it is such a challenge to see how far you can take your body. I get there, there's, it's funny because there's a picture that was taken back in, I think it was 2016. Yeah. Um, in Pittsburgh, it was at the NPC Masters Nationals. It wasn't at the competition, but it was, we were doing a photo shoot with uh, an organization called Aging Evolution. That's for those who are 50 and older. And there is a picture that's circulating. It keeps on circulating over social media. And it's got, you know, it says like 50, 52, 54. At the time, I want to say I was, because if it's four years ago, I was 52 or something like that. And, you know, you get those, oh, wonderful, wonderful. And then you get those others say, oh, well, yeah, and steroids is just a number two or is just this and that. I laugh at that because if somebody confuses me with taking, then, oh, my goodness, unfortunately, they don't know because I should be so much bigger. If or you're doing thinking. something very right, too. That's true, too. Or but the other thing is they'll say, hey, at that age, you can't put muscle on. And that is BS. That is not true. And that's one of the reasons why I've had so many times some coaches in the past, oh, Monica, you've got great genetics. You know, if you just took a little bit of this or just took a little bit of that. And I said, well, but what's the use of that at my age? The whole point is I want to show others through injury, through age, through circumstance, through, you know, it's through the adaptations that you can basically see how far you can get and then adapt to still 
gain the goals that you want to have. So I believe that you can do this. Bodybuilding is a very healthy sport when it is done naturally, and it's one that you can sustain over a long period of time. Can you sustain competition, prep, nutrition, and workouts? Not all year round, of course not. But that's where you have your off season. That's when you have that that on really leaning in whatever prep that will be about three months or so. And it's that last week beforehand, if anything, that's when it's the most unhealthy, if you want to call it that way or not. Throughout the entire career of working out, and this may be a bit too much information, but I think it's important for people out there, a lot of bodybuilders will not get, let female bodybuilders, a menstrual cycle until maybe two, three, four months after. It was always, I might skip one month or six weeks, but it was always there. And that's what should tell you if what you're doing is okay to your own body. And um, that that's just a, a real, real important part of it. Yes, it can be done naturally. And yes, it's it, it can be done for a very, very long time and very healthily. Well, and I compare it too to sort of like running where it's like, yeah, running's healthy, but the, if you're running a half marathon every single day, yeah, then it's unhealthy. Just like, it's just like something like that where, yeah, if you do it the right way, yeah, it can be healthy, but anything in life can be unhealthy. I mean, drinking soda, if you drink like one soda a week, it's fine. But if you're drinking like 10 a day, you know, yeah, it's unhealthy. So it's, yeah, it's just like so many other things, you know, really balance. in life, but yeah, exactly. that's, 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 that's the hard really thing to find, but has it been easier now for this last year for your training after, you know, you had your surgery and everything, or have you mixed things up at all this last year when it comes to your training? You know, when it came to the surgery, again, adaptation is so important. I am not happy at all where I am right now in terms of the surgeries, but the way I see it, it's first of all, not giving up, rather pushing through to see how far you can go within that new circumstance. You know, what it was before the surgery is not necessarily what it's going to be after, but it's still pushing, 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 seeing how far you can get with the rehab, with the time, because that's another thing too. It does take time. Once you know how far you are or you can get, including that injury or that recovery, then it's time to adapt in whatever way you need in order to get the same results in no way. And you know what? And I, I can still do, you know, squats and deadlifts and all of that, but there's some people who go through surgery, who, who go through injuries. And you know what? If you can't squat, you can still bench press or you can still, you can still work certain of the muscles, but in a different way to be able to get that same result, which in this case, if it's to be on stage, you just do different things. I, I tell people who are, um, you know, over 40, 45, 50, I don't have to jump a bunch. I don't have to do jump squats. I don't have to jump onto boxes. I can get the same results by being a little bit um, less airborne in what I am doing. And, and that's perfectly fine. And sometimes I think people don't realize that when, when you're doing your cardio, you don't have to run forever. Remember, it's about fat burning. It's not about burning off the muscle that you tried to put on so much throughout the year either. And, and that's something that I think sometimes people don't realize. So yeah, it's, it's been different. It's been difficult. Well, for me, since I'm not competing, it's been interesting trying different things out. Um, focusing a little bit. So one of the things that I feel for myself when the time comes to go back to competition, in my mind, I've told myself, I'm going to need a year and a half to two years of prep to get the muscle size that I used to have before. Because although, you know, I've still have... She's still good. She's still got everyone. It's still embarrassing still got, me, basically. I mean, yeah, what just, I walk around with, but the size has shrunk. I'm not eating the five or six meals that are consistent with everything they need to keep my, naturally, I tend to have, if I were completely left to my own devices, a couple meals a day, but I know I can't do that. So it's been interesting seeing where I personally fit in with everyday life, but at the same time, what I need to do 
um, if and when the time comes, you know, for, for the competition. But you can't do that 24-7, 365 days a year. So that also plays with your psyche. Don't get me wrong. If you have been on stage for a while, and especially when I'm coaching my athletes and seeing them and going through all the changes and you get so excited for them, but at the same time, part of you says, man, I'm not there. But it's telling yourself, it's okay. You don't need to be there because this is not your time. Your time and place is elsewhere. And my job right now is whether it is judging or whether it is coaching. And I'm super excited. I have, uh, I took a couple of athletes to the Natural Olympia. One of them ended up with five gold medals, two overalls, three pro qualifications. And I know that is her work 100%. But part of that reflects, it's like, man, that makes me feel good, you know, just to be able to say, I've got a natural Olympia champion under my belt, not just myself, but even being able to see somebody else go off and do that. Absolutely. And I mean, we haven't had that many natural Olympians on the podcast. I think we probably had like a handful of them. So is there any difference other than, you know, obviously like the drug testing, is there any overall difference like in the competition and in the posing or anything, or is it just, you know, it's just drug tested is the only difference really? No, I mean, actually there is. So if you look at, and the thing with the natural federations, there are many different federations, which is unfortunately sometimes, I mean, it's great to have the variety. It's also made it to where because there are so many, you get much fewer competitors in each one because, you know, with NPC, IFBB, there's just the NPC, the National Physique Committee. And so everybody funnels into that. Um, with the natural federations, and I think they are trying so much to try to bring people together. And so if you are a qualified pro in most natural federations, it allows you to compete in the other federations with that same pro qualification. Now, different federations are different in what they do with the INBA and some of the natural ones do. There's a little bit more of, we do a T-walk as opposed to, for example, an NPC. If you're a figure competitor, you will go out to the box and you will do your routine, your figure routine within that same, you know, X marks the spot or so. With some of the natural federations, it gives the judges a little bit more chance to see you walking, to see you going. So you would head out onto the stage, you'd go stage left to the corner, you'd go stage right, you'd come back, do a little turn, and then back to your area. You always get um, judged on your quarter turns, your comparisons, uh, those in physique or bodybuilding still have their routines. So a lot of it is the, the same, just slight different nuances here or there. Uh, another great thing that which I absolutely love about the INBA is because most of your organizations have your traditional figure, bikini, physique. For guys, it's the classic physique or the women, men bodybuilding. And that's pretty well. And now we're adding wellness or so to it. And that's pretty much it. What the INBA does is it branches out a little bit, which gives a platform for those who may not be your typical bodybuilders, but somebody in transformation, like I talked about earlier. We have the angels, and the angels are that Rio de Janeiro, um, basically that carnival, you know, you can wear those huge wings and come out and strut your stuff. We have something called... Um, your your beat your swimsuit model or your sports model, which is more of a GQ kind of thing. And another category which has just started, you know, to each their own. There are a few people who absolutely love this because it's a bit more of a pageantry kind of thing. And that's your evening gown or evening wear. And you get the ladies who wouldn't necessarily want to come out strutting their stuff half naked, but they have the most beautiful evening dress. Um, and it's something else that allows them to put themselves out there, especially if you want to get out of your comfort zone and get on a stage and do it that way. That really does sound like a great idea. I don't get why they don't at least try some of those for the MPC because yeah, it's, 
I mean, it takes a lot of courage to go up there in a bikini, basically. And, and you know, a lot. I mean, I would never do that personally. I mean, for what the guys wear, too, it's like it's not it's not very <laughs> flattering, even for the guys as well. But, I mean, you're a judge. And is there any – I mean, every judge has a different taste, sort of, and they sort of look for some different things. Is there anything that really specifically defines you really as a judge when it comes to what you're looking for? I'll tell you one thing that's my pet peeve when I'm judging. <laughs> and <laughs> And I thought – so what some people do initially when you start to compete, you may not exactly know where you fit in a category. For the females, am I bikini? Am I figure? Am I phys- Usually you'll see bikini and figure crossing over or somebody who is more defined or has a bit more musculature may go in between figure and physique to figure that out. Um, in the INBA, they might go into sports model just because, or they might try a couple of the other categories as well. For the guys, it's usually classic physique and bodybuilding, or some of them might try the physique, which are the board shorts and classic, you know, j- just to see where they fit in. My biggest pet peeve is having a bikini girl or a figure girl showing off their physique or bodybuilding muscle. Or somebody who's doing physique or figure doing their their little bikini sassy posing. So whenever you are in a class, you need to stick to you need to read the um, the actual what that category, what the criteria is. And you need to stick to doing that criteria for me personally. That counts as points off if you are in one class now. If you're going to do the several different classes, and I can speak that way because I've done them. I actually did almost every single class, except I did not do angels or so that exists. But the thing is, it's getting into that persona and getting into that class and really being able to focus only on what that class asks you for. So if you're doing figure and you're really trying to bring out your shoulders and show that V taper and there you are, but you also try bikini. Well, from bikini, I want to let my shoulders down. I want to look much smaller. Um, it's a whole different look. And you can do that potentially with your body if you have a good posing coach, if you pay attention. But if you just go out there and do the same routine, the same thing for every single category, you're not really getting into what it's supposed to be. How Another long? thing, uh, you know what? Now that I'm on here, okay, <laughs> absolutely, I'm sorry, Ryan. I'm gonna. The other thing is conditioning and musculature. I was just about so, to ask that. Good. So many judges, and you'll see a lot of the male judges even more so. They think, oh, bigger, bigger. The bigger person will always win. And you know, I've been on several judging panels where all of a sudden a result is given, and that the guy that was bigger and beefier gets that second or third place versus somebody who is tighter, but much smaller. And they just, you know, will bad sportsmanship, you know, will grab that medal and, you know, just take it off the minute they can. The thing is that, you know, we're judging on musculature. We're judging on symmetry and we're also judging on conditioning. There are, you know, some ways of thinking where, oh, the big, if the person is big, that's what we want to see. I don't. For me, the conditioning is super, super important. It's easy to get big, especially nowadays, you know, with, with everything that's out there. But it's super hard to get conditioned, keep that musculature and be symmetrical in your body parts. That's what, you know, and people need to realize that. That's what we're looking at. One other last thing is if I saw you backstage and you have a beautifully tapered back and are really wide, but then you come out on stage and you're closing your back up because you think in your mind, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm flexing my back, but instead, instead of opening it wide, you're closing it. And that's what I see. I can't judge you on what I saw and I know you're capable of. I can only judge you on what you're showing me on stage right there. And you'll hear the the coaches 
open up, open up, you know, and, and in my mind, I'm going, open up, open up. But those are sometimes some of the disappointments that you'll see with results of people maybe who would have gotten a win, but maybe ended up second or third just because they they worked out in the gym. They have an amazing body, but they didn't work on the presentation on stage. And that's what we get to see. And that's what we can judge on. Well, just being someone that just watches some of the shows, how long did it take you to sort of develop that eyesight that you need to really see these differences? Because I look at some of these comparisons on stage and I was like, I couldn't rake them. I'll just be, it would just oh, for me. I'm, just, I'm still developing yeah. that eyesight. It would I just was, be like me, put their names in a hat and I'll draw one and we'll see who wins. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, when you have, you know, four to seven people on stage, it's a lot easier than if you have 22 people on stage. And thank goodness I have not been in a show where I've had that which is what happened at the Natural Olympia this past year, two weekends ago, where in bikini and in uh, classic physique, you had, and I think even in physique, you had 22 competitors on stage. Now, thank goodness I wasn't judging something like that. And, and I don't think, I think, you know, in the past, I've been judging now for about three years, um, did a judge's clinic to begin with, and each federation has their different criteria by which you judge. So, I can't go in as an INBA judge and judge um, a, a, a different federation because they will have different criteria. So each federation that you go to, uh, yesterday's was an NFF, Naturally Fit Federation, for example. And so their criteria is slightly different. So I've got to go and read and, and do their workshops, so to speak. And, and the same thing goes for each one. Um, it is, it takes time and it takes, I think what helps a lot is having competed yourself, knowing what you need. And, you know, I've been fortunate for me, it's a lot easier to judge the figure girls, to judge the physique, uh, and even the bodybuilding and the bodybuilding for men. It's a little bit more difficult for me to judge the bikini, um, or even some of the, physique for men just because that's a little bit different I've learned to do so but you have to go back to the criteria if you've competed yourself it makes it a little bit easier but there's some great judges who have never competed in their lives but they really will follow that criteria and are very analytical one thing that I did want to get your opinion on is because the thing that is unique about bodybuilding is that if you have you know let's say like eight people on stage and one of them is just above and beyond so much better than everyone else. Like they're just so much bigger. They're so much more conditioned. Sometimes they won't win because they are so far out of what everyone else is looking like. And that's always been strange to me because that would be like if you had like Adrian Pearson line up with a bunch of high school running backs and then they choose one of the high school running backs because they look more like, but like, what is, have you ever had to deal with that? And you know, have you ever had to talk to people about that? Cause I've always found that to be odd. Like what is the reasoning? If you've heard about anything, why that may happen where someone who like, obviously should have won that is just so much bigger and better. They don't get it because they are so out of place. Luckily, I've not had to witness specifically that. Having said that, something that is similar to what you're talking. And you know what? A lot of times there are some reasonings behind that, that, you know, if, if it's a judge's panel that we don't understand, um, it might even be, Sometimes you notice, and that goes for NPC as well as natural organizations, that you say, hmm, there's something that's not quite right over here. And so the judges will not reward something that they think is off. That can happen as well. But what does happen a lot, you'll see a lot of figure and physique, for example, crossing over. And I'm talking specifically in, you know, some of the natural federations. Now, if you are a good judge and if you have good competitors, and what I mean is because you can only judge on what is in front of you, if you have a first place in figure who crosses over and then also competes in physique, ideally that person should not get first place in both figure and physique because it's different criteria and you're looking at, and even if that person is fantastic, they should get a first place in one, maybe a second place in the other. Um, over the weekend, that's exactly, and, and I'll talk about um, my athlete was there who got, like I said, the five goals, and she got them in. It was figure classic, which is an amazing category that unfortunately NPC doesn't have because it's a one-piece figure suit, which is beautiful. 
So she did that. She competed in figure and she also competed in physique and she got a first place in each of those. Well, figure and, cl and classic figure, that's okay. But you have figure and physique. What happened at the time is that the judges with the competitors that were on stage, they deemed either her that much better based on what they saw there to where she fit the criteria for those who were the competitors who were on that stage at that particular time. I've had it when I was in uh, some of the world championships. This happened in both Greece as well as in Czech Republic where I was crossing over and I got a first in one of them, but then ended up getting a second in the other. And we were told as competitors, hey, if you wanna sign up to cross over, you can, but the judges are gonna penalize you because you're not going to get the same, and th this was told to everyone. So we went there knowing that and expecting that, and it was interesting just to see where they thought the physique fit better in that category. Well, and ever since I started this podcast, I've been trying to find my great white buffalo, which is, and in your experience that you've had, who is the most genetically blessed, at least female natural bodybuilder that you've ever seen? Oh my goodness. There are many. I've been trying to find the one that literally can just like look at a weight and like put on size because then I will like try to, you know, like either kidnap no, them or something no, 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 and no, just. No. See, that's, <laughs> nobody can. Now, there are. Genetics is an amazing thing. So I want you to go look at and pictures from before. There, there is somebody that comes to mind, Tenika Heinemann, and she's Australian. She, this was probably maybe 10 years ago. She was at her peak. Then she had children. She came back a few years ago, which was wonderful. Now, Tenika is somebody who had her clavicle, her up here. I mean, she has these beautiful clavicle to wear. If you were to look at her walking across the street, you'd say, well, there's nothing special about her. Even backstage, I remember looking at her going, well, what's so special? All of a sudden, she just comes out on stage and all she has to do is widen up and lift. And it was right there. I mean, those shoulders popping. And it's just because part of it, of course, she worked so hard. But the beautiful structure, genetic structure that she had that allowed her that initial V taper, you know, and, and she's an amazing competitor. And speaking of those competitors from abroad, I can't wait. We had 16 countries at the Natural O this past month. Usually we have up to 50, 60 countries that are part of it. Of course, many countries still couldn't come because of COVID, but it is so special when you get those athletes coming from the Eastern Bloc, from Latin South America. Well, who, who the heck knows what those Eastern Bloc people are doing anyway? Because <laughs> they are, you know, and what's very interesting is they come in usually really, the, the Eastern Bloc, a lot of times they're very stringy and tight, really, really tight. It's the Australians that come in a little thicker and oh my gosh, do they, they have the muscle. Uh, we had this time around some amazing couple from Argentina who, who ended and the Argentines brought their team up here. Hopefully they'll come to my July show, which, you know, would be great if they, they come to Texas as well. But it's so interesting just to see even the populations and how different countries train and as a team, what they bring uh, in, into the mix. Absolutely. I mean, for me so far, the one guest that's come the closest is Tiffany Boyle. I don't know if you know her. Yeah. She's yes. genetically blessed. I don't understand that. Like it's, she's shown photo of her, of her with her siblings and they're all just, they must've just been born with six packs basically. And then it's like that out of the womb. I do not understand that, but um, yeah. I, Genetics I, is huge. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, you know, God gives you what, what that basis of what you have to work to and you can build from there, but it always helps. But let me just say that to the people who aren't genetically gifted that way. I have seen so many athletes who have outperformed those who are genetically gifted just because of the work that they have put in and, and the patience and the time. 
So it's, it can just, it's a great thing. I mean, my dad does have a friend where he is so hyperactive that he makes me look dull, which is, you know, that's something that I never thought would happen, but he can literally go through. I mean, he looks like he could maybe come like he's in very good shape and he eats, he could eat, you know, 10 Snickers bars a day and just go. I, I think it's because of all of the energy that he has. Like he must just burn it off naturally like that. But yeah, there are some of those people that make you just question like why, like, but hopefully I just hope God's playing a cruel joke on him and one day they're going to wake up at 400 pounds and, you know, I'll finally have my justice. But, you know, it has not happened yet. But you talked about your show in July. I don't know if we discussed this last time. I'm not sure. But how did that, you know, come to be? And and what are you looking for, especially for this next year? Oh, my gosh. I'm super excited. It, it was just a, I think it was a great um, just progression from one thing to another to another. And um, the Caicos family in California, they're the ones that are the presidents of the INBA and PNBA. And they said, hey, Monica, we really want to have a show in, in Texas. It's been a while. Texas was represented before, but, you know, most of the shows are in, uh, sort of out west in California or there's several that are out in the east. So we put this together. It's the Mr. Miss USA. It's an amateur show, a pro show. I was so fortunate. We had 16 states represented um, we had about which, you know, and, and usually local uh, natural shows are very small. And this was still, you know, with some of COVID and everything else, we had 40 competitors, which was fantastic, represented from as far away as Hawaii because they had closed down everything from them. The great thing about this show, it was a natural Olympia qualifier, which usually doesn't happen that early in the year. It's usually after August, September, October, and only certain shows are qualifiers. This one is, it's going to be next year as well. We had the, we had several of our pros were natural Olympia current and past champions who came to compete in Dallas as well. For the athlete's sake, it was a wonderful show because the hotel, the venue, everything was all in one. So it made it, you know, I, first and foremost, I am an athlete and a competitor myself. So I know what I want. I know what my needs are as an athlete. And as a promoter, it was great to be able to take that and give it to the athletes as much as possible and make something that was you know, seamless, a really fun, good show with all sorts of, we even had, um, this year, we're, we're going to have a barbecue after the show as well. Good old Texas barbecue for everybody coming over. You're going to probably have to spend a couple grand on food because of all these people eating afterwards. Good God. <laughs> exactly. Well, last year, I mean, it was amazing. We had, you know, our, our sponsors were great. We had, you know, uh, locally, it's great. Momo's Donuts over here in Texas. They're the ones that all the, the competitors love. They brought a bunch of donuts for afterwards. The prep kitchen helped us with things. My my home gym destination, Dallas, was absolutely amazing because everybody that came was allowed to train at this gym the whole week before, which is only about a mile away from the venue, too. So had some great stuff going on. And we're looking forward to doing the same thing again next year. And And I'd love even other natural competitors, if you've competed before, if you're thinking about it, there will be a category for you. And even if you are have gone to another federation, be great for you to try something new. And if you are a pro, as long as you're in good standing with whichever federation you are at, you can come and compete in our federation too. Absolutely. And I mean, a training technique that I had never heard of, that I'm this this podcast that I'm going to publish with a guest that I had on is going to be like a week before yours. So people will see this, you don't have time, but she does this thing with air compression training. And I thought, you know, you got to ask Monica if she's ever tried that because for anyone that like has no, no training techniques, I was like, Monica might know that. So have you ever heard about anything like that? Air compression training? Yeah. She like uses air, like as part of the way it's like, she's opening a gym in Colorado that like does that what? where it's like you use air and apparently it's much harder to do. Like if you could deadlift like 400 pounds, apparently you could only do like 250 if it's like air, just because it's like every single it's all condensed kind of like, you know, like when yeah. you have like those bags full of air that are just so tight just because the air is so condensed into it. it yeah. I think it's something like that where like you're literally lifting all the weight. But I, I was just wondering if you'd ever heard anything because I had never heard anything like that. And I did some research on it and there's not that much on there. But she she claims that it's the great thing. And I was like, well, Monica, I mean, if there's anyone no, to ask. I've heard of it. Um, I haven't been able to to do any. But, you know, when when you think about it, the other thing, too, is because. It's a lot harder to do, but you're lifting less. So you'd think that for your joints, not only that, but it's, you know, it's 
when you're lifting, but also it's when you're letting down, you're also um, have that tension that's there. So what a great thing. I'm, I'm going to have to watch that podcast and, and see, and if it's in Colorado too, fantastic. Yep. Colorado where, I mean, she claimed that she was having bad weather, but I mean, Minnesota's Colorado weather on steroids. So, you know, that's, that, that's what I told her, but you know, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. But I mean, I've got a daughter in Colorado and, and I saw one of her IG posts today and they're getting their tree. They have this big, um, Zeus is his name. He's their great Dane and they're out and it's snowing, but they're cut. They're out there choosing their real tree that they're going to bring back. And I'm thinking, wow, we don't have that here yet. Uh, let, let's hope we don't have another snow again like we did last February. <laughs> I wish I had a, a great day because our little dog, we have to go outside every time she's out there because we have coyotes and, you know, some, some animals around here. But I was, I just told my parents like, just get a great day. And then we don't have to worry about it. There's no coyote in the world is going to take on a fully grown great Dane. And you know, that's that, that's suicide basically. But unfortunately we haven't, but yeah, I, we went to Colorado once and I saw Rockies game. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful state. And you know, we took a tour of the Broncos stadium and we did all that. I do remember that, you know, I, and I want to go back there sometime soon. So hopefully, you know, I can, I can really get on that. But I mean, like you got your hall of fame ring. What was that moment like for you when they presented you in the hall of fame? Because that's gotta be such a great achievement just to, I couldn't even fathom really being in the hall of fame for anything really. <laughs> You know, that was, I think, the culmination in the epitome. It, it it was a very, very special moment to me. You know, the INBA has five different pillars. It's spirit, loyalty, uh, de- dedication, and I'm missing the other two off the top of my head right now. Hall of right Fame inductee doesn't even know the dead. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, exactly, exactly. But so each year there are four or five recipients that are chosen worldwide to be a part of this Hall of Fame. And it was very special to me, not just um, Mike O'Hearn is is one of the Hall of Famers for the INBA actually too. So it was, you know, these are a, a legendary and such a special group of people. And then on top of that, you look and being a female being inducted into the Hall of Fame too, because we are a few less than the guys are. It was very special. And so this year at the Natural Olympia, when the new Hall of Famers were inducted, it was very special to stand up on stage and give each one of them, shake their hand and give them a hug and and sort of welcome them being that older part of it now. It's very special. But being inducted into the Hall of Fame, the work isn't done. It just means that, you know, that that puts even more responsibility, I think, on those of us who are part of it to continue to spread the word, to be part of that platform and to see the progression of the organization and, you know, be there for those in many different ways, regardless of how it is that whether they want to compete or just want a healthier lifestyle, because one of the things we do too is kids bodybuilding and kids aren't going to be lifting necessarily the same way. Oh, I want to see that five-year-old that's just, you know, just jacked out of, out of their mind, just on stage. Well, and that's, I don't know how healthy that is, but it's, yeah. it's being able to be, you know, in whatever your fitness is, as well as we have athletes that come who are, um, might be in the physically adaptive or, or they might have a physically challenged standing or seated. That's another thing that is amazing to me and being able, you know, to see how they can adapt and what they can do to live that lifestyle and and to be part of this global organization as well. It's cool. Those are some of the most inspiring things that I've ever seen in my life are those videos of the the adapted people, how they're doing. I mean, there was a guy without any hands and he was still doing like curls and stuff like that because he had the, the weight just like strapped to his forearm, basically. Just just those people for me. I mean, that's that's special recognition in and of itself. But I've always had an idea for any competition. Here's what you should do, though, too. Like, you know how there's an award for the best poser? You have yeah. these people on stage and you see who can last the longest in a pose that you have the endurance <laughs> challenge. So then you get the endurance trophy because that to me should be even more important than just winning. Cause if you have someone that can hold this for, you know, hold like a lats person like that for like, you just, you just see who can last the longest. You have like a fear factor kind of thing going on. I don't know, but that would be awesome. I think if they did something like that, you are so right. Well, let me tell you this. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough this year after all these years of bodybuilding, it was the first year I went to Orlando and I was able to be part of the Olympia over there. Um, Next year, I think they're taking it back to Las Vegas again, but it was so exciting, so special to to be there as part of it. And then, you know, watching close up and then watching from, from afar, but you are right. 
when it came to the two twelves, when it came to the open bodybuilding for men, those got they were working them. It was over and over and over again. And the reason for that is, okay, let's see who tires the first. Let's see who loses their poses. Let's see who starts breaking a sweat or gets a cramp. And that's exactly what some of those judges will do with that top first and second place, continuing to work them with everyone else, similar to what you're saying, but in a different sense, who will break it the first? So wait, even sweat would ruin someone just because it might take some of the color off from them? Because to me, it's like, you can't really control someone sweating, really. I mean, that's just... No, it's not, it's not the sweat, but what you will see every so often, you know, you're supposed to peak and you're supposed to be at your driest and your tightest when you're on that stage. Sometimes you'll see guys or, or women for that matter who haven't peaked just quite and all of a sudden that extra little bit of water that should have come off beforehand, they may have looked fantastic the day before, but they might have carved up a little too much or they might, you know, it's that spilling over and it's so difficult to get it just right for that stage. And so if all of a sudden they've spilled over while you're turning them, on stage, they may start literally that water is coming out of them. It's not that they're sweating because they're hot, but they're just dropping and losing that water and tightening up. But that's also a giveaway that mm, they didn't quite peak. They're, they're looking better and better as they go around. But that process is happening on stage as opposed to having happened maybe an hour or two or the night before. Yep. Once I got to turn my light on because I'm getting super dark over here. <laughs> Right. I see, I, there I we go it. much yeah, much much go. better yeah because i was like the damn midwest you know it's getting you're, it's getting you're, wait yeah. are you an hour ahead of us no are we the same no time? we're the same we're central time but like for some reason up here it just it's seems not dark like here yet though yeah so like i work 11 to 7 so now i'm never going to be able to get off you know work when it's still light <laughs> outside at least for at least you know for a couple couple of nights now but i mean being that you were at the olympia i've had her on i just want to get your opinion is andrea shaw ever going to be challenged ever for miss olympia because it just seems like any year that she decides to compete you know you just have to give it to her because it's it's not She's even amazing. close yeah she was amazing she was amazing you know it's it's one of those things that you go on you go on you go on you go on um and then when you don't it is so hard to come back and if you do come back and you do as well or better than before more power to you you know that that's absolutely fantastic. It was it was a really really good Olympia. Yeah, no, um, it, and I, and I'm glad they really they really did it well and just yeah, it's I mean just this whole year has been you know one of the transformative years I think in bodybuilding. I think it, eventually it will be for the better because like there are some people that have been talking about how you know physique they're gonna maybe trim it down a little bit now where you don't you're not gonna get so lean and so big where you're basically a bodybuilder where they're maybe gonna you know trim things down. So hopefully that comes to be because yeah, I don't want to see some of these people you know dying and stuff like that and having to do this for this sport because to me it's not necessary i mean there's a way to do this and you know it's it's just unfortunate that it happens but yeah i mean it it, it it's great that you know we talk to you about this stuff because you are just an absolute wealth of knowledge and i mean yeah it, it's it's just amazing but you know with the the whole natural you know competing or not well, i won't even say natural because you are talking about you said the myth before i was just you know i had a brain fart right there but you talked about how you know there's that myth that older people can't really put on size and you know obviously that's not true but what do you say to people that think that because there are i think a lot of people who might be older who want to get in shape but they just hear that myth all the time and they're just like well i can't really do anything anyways it's a complete myth now you can't of course go from zero to a hundred within a few days so it you know, I always say you've got to first figure out where, where are you before, you know, you know, you know where you want to go to, but where are you right now? Are you at a zero? Are you at a 15? Are you at a 30? Are you at a 40? Because if you want to get to that 100, you've got to figure out what you're doing first. And even if it's, you know, starting for those who have never even done anything physical, it's walking that dog is going out for a walk. It's, you know, doing a bit of yoga. It's getting I have so many people that ask me, do I have to go to a gym to start working out? I was like, no. And I think COVID proved that to all of us. You can, from home, there's so many things that you can do with your own body weight, with, ten, you know. Well, I mean, even you, even you posted those gym. videos during the pandemic that I recommend for everyone to go and see. I loved watching those. Those were awesome. It's amazing what you can do yourself. And the thing is that after you are past that, 
then you're ready to do something else and to go onward. You know, I always say, and the body adapts so well. So wherever you are, once you are ready to progress, your body will tell you that. It'll be way too easy in what you are doing, and you're going to want to challenge yourself a little bit more. It's very difficult for those who start off. They've never done anything before. They go to the gym one time. A trainer or somebody will put them through a workout. They are so sore that they don't even want to know anything about going to a gym or working out for another month. And then they do the same thing the next month. No. No. Start really small and slowly, 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 slowly each day. My son started something very interesting. This was about 10 days ago or so. He, he had read it somewhere. He said, you know, mom, I'm going to start doing one push-up, one sit-up, and what is it? Uh, push-up, sit-up, and I think a squat or something like that uh, every, on the hour, every hour. That's the first day. Second day, it's two on the hour, every hour. The third day, it's three. Well, that's how before you know it, you're doing 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, and, and 100 squats or whatever that is, just because you have done that, you know, just slowly, slowly, slowly increasing. That's the kind of thing you need to do. So for those, especially those who are older, who think you can't put on muscle, BS, yes, you can. Take it slow. And especially for those who are older, you want to do some sort of strength training because of your bones. Osteoporosis, you want to get away from that. So just like aerobic exercise is important for your heart's health, so is strength training exercise just to keep those bones strong. We don't want brittle bones. Well, and I mean, the, a friend of mine did something similar where it was one of my brother's friend's brother he was one of those, they call him Hercules. That was his nickname just because he was, you know, genetic. He would do that. He would go all the way from, he would do like push ups, pull ups, and squats. He would go from one to 20 and then go back down from 20 to one. I don't even know. I mean, that's like 400 or something like that. I don't even know how many you like you're doing, but that's, that's insane. Amount. But I also did a similar thing. So at my job, you know, there's trucks that come in. I told myself, I said, I'm going to do 10 push ups every single time a truck comes in. We had 59 trucks come in during a shift. So, you know, that wasn't really the best idea of mine. So I, I gave up after about 20. You know, I'm like, yeah, you know, that's good enough for me. That's a good enough workout for me, you know. So I, I, I got it down to five now. And, you know, even that sometimes it's just like, you know, hey, you know. But, yeah, it's just it's just doing something and just moving. I mean, yeah, you can find so many household things like with your videos, which I'll leave a link for people to do because those are super informative too. And it's, yeah, you can do so much with so little and people just do not understand that. You know, and one thing, if, if people have questions too, um, my husband, Dr. Greg and I, we do on the first and third Wednesday of the month, we do these Facebook lives through his CA acupuncture and chiropractic clinic. And, you know, that to us, it's, it's a PSA. I mean, it's just a way to give back. We love getting... Um, input and info just from people, hey, talk about this topic or that. It's always has a nutritional component. It has a physical fitness component. And then it has a condition component because I'm not a doctor. He is. So he can deal with that side of it. And then, of course, it's the mindset. And, you know, that's something that we literally do just as a way to, you know, inquiring minds want to know. And we don't know everything. But if there's something somebody says, oh, Talk about the uh, nutrition for blood type diet or this or that. I don't necessarily know much about it, but as a former journalist that I was, I go, I look into it, and then I'll bring some information on whatever those topics are. So, you know, it's, it's a fun kind of thing that we do for whoever wants to listen. Yeah, and that's right. And I saw that you have YouTube videos as well that you guys published from a few years back where you guys would go on and talk. And you know, Yeah, yeah we need to go and publish there you know there need to be more content. people doing those because yeah there's so much information out. and like we've talked about a million times i mean for every good coach there's about 10 bad coaches so you know it's just to get that information out there is just is just so great and you know what you're doing and you know as always you know i ask these questions to you every single time and you know these are the two questions that i'm gonna ask every time you're on but if you could change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding what would it be oh man if i could change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding would be to I would want it to be more not as closed right now because it is a small circle. I would like to broaden it and open it up to as many people as would want. And in so doing, you would have your traditional, but you also have all those other categories and things for people to look at it as a healthier lifestyle. I mean, I'd like to change some of that um, mindset of, oh, this is unhealthy. No, done right, it is healthy. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. And that needs to be more. And I mean, if anything that, that this podcast can do, you know, I really do hope it does that. But when we do talk to you a year from now, where would you like to be at? You know, not even just in your health and fitness journey, but also, I mean, just, just your overall life as well. Where would you like to be at? Well, I'll tell you, it's been a very strange last several months because finally we've pretty much become empty nesters, which is crazy. So right now, I mean, my husband and I have been married for 34 years. It was <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And we're basically looking at each other and assessing, oh, do I like you? Yeah, I do like you. Hey, we just raised kids for the past 20 some odd years. And now it's becoming a little bit more not just introspective, but all the things that we can do now um, when it comes to the health and fitness, not just for us, but being able to give a little bit more of ourselves, trying to integrate, incorporate. I want to bring, I want this show to do really well. I want it to have a life of its own. Um, I want to do more just with, you know, put the word out there to others. And if I had my dream, dream life and job, it would be to spend 10 days out of the month in three different countries, and then maybe another couple weeks over here in the US going around spreading the word and doing that on a yearly basis. I would love that. That'd be so much fun. Well, you know, I wish I could do that. You know, I would love to do that. But here's the thing. I haven't admitted it in the podcast yet, but I'm going to. I have a very extreme fear of flying. Absolutely hate it. I, that's just me. All the more I mean, to go and do it. I know. All the more to go and do it. I'm the 9-11 generation where, you know, that just still freaks me out to this day. You know, just, I mean, we took a trip to Florida for baseball in high school. We had extreme turbulence and I was losing my mind. Like I was... Yeah, I I was just drenched in sweat and stuff, and you know I just and even on the plane ride back, you know I I kissed the floor of the airport when we got when we got back to Minnesota on the ground. That's how excited I was that we actually made it back. So, I mean, yeah, if I could travel by sea, but but here's the thing though, I think it's more of like just with people on a plane, you're all cramped in. Like if I had my own private jet, you know, I think I'd be fine, and you know I wouldn't it wouldn't bother me at all. But that's something that I mean I. I Project here for you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. I, I think you should, you know, get a bus, yeah. refurbish yeah. a bus. You can have your own oh, I touring wish. bus and I go wish. do your podcast all around the country. Hey, and even take them even in. If South I made America. enough, if I trust me, if I made enough money, that would actually be what I was doing. That's the only problem is, you know, hey, if I had, you know, yeah, that's for people out there. So everyone donate to my GoFundMe. I'll leave it down and blah, blah, blah. No, just kidding. But like, no, if I did have. Put it out there. Yeah, I should. Set but if those I, intentions. Yeah, if I did have that money, believe me, that's what I would be doing. I would just be traveling because I would love to do that. Yeah, that would be a dream. My, so when I started this podcast, what I initially wanted to do, my dream was to like go touring with bands and stuff like that when they go on their tours and stuff like rock bands. Because that's what that was my first 100 guests was rock bands because I'm a huge into that. So that was my dream was like, hey, maybe the, one of these bands is going to be like, hey, this guy's pretty good. Let's have him like go and film us on tour because that would that was my dream because I just watched all those movies growing up of bands on tour. And I was like, I want to do that. Like that seems like it's it's fun. But, you know, so, hey, yeah, I could definitely eventually try to do something like that but hey you know this podcast is slowly growing and you know hey i'm i'm in it for the long haul you know as long as it stays interesting to me and as long as it stays fun and you've inspired me i want to have more natural bodybuilders on because i'm gonna be completely honest some of these horror stories that i've heard of you know what goes on and that's it it hasn't really put me off the sport too much but it, like it's it's almost ruined the image some somewhat for me of like seeing all that and then you're like wow this is actually like the real side of things so now I kind of want to, I mean, I still have bodybuilders on that I know blatantly, but it's just because, you know, you kind of see that and it kind of, you're just like, wow, like it's, you do, you do that much. And it's just, I'm just being honest here. So yeah, I want to have more natural competitors on too. Cause it's, to me, that's, I that's awesome, can but, give you a yeah. whole list. Of so who is, well, I was going to ask you, so who is like the Linda Murray of, of female natural bodybuilding? Who's like the one, like the greatest one that like everyone that I should have on really. So here's once again, well, I'll tell you, there's Alondra Chapman right now. She is a figure Olympia champion second uh, for the second time. She is featured in um, Generation Iron. They did something, you know, where they followed several of these competitors, Brandon Lirio. Um, there's William Long and John Suey when it comes to the uh, physique side of it. Brandon is a three-time champion in classic uh, physique for, for the guys. Um, there, I can give you bikini. I can get, I mean, oh my goodness, there are some incredible athletes out there. And I would love to to set you on a path to take a look at them and to bring them on your Absolutely, show. Absolutely, because I want to show too that 
you know, th- that whole the whole sport isn't just the narrative that's being published. There's so much more to it, and there's so many more different categories. So, yeah, I would personally, you know, I would love to do that. And, yeah, uh, I would love Sounds to good. have more of them on. Absolutely. And, again, you know, Monica, as always, it is a delight to have you on and talk to you. I mean, I was – I'm thank God you're the guest that I'm talking to after this Vikings-Packers game because I was like, I can't talk that much. Like, <laughs> my heart's still pounding even a little bit right now. Like, I can't talk much. So I was like, I know Monica talks a lot, which is awesome. So I was like, this is going to be a great – she's the perfect <laughs> guest to have on now because I was like, I don't want to give myself a heart attack by amping myself up, you know, even more now than I am. But I know you got to go and watch your Dallas game right now, so I, I didn't want to hold you on for that long. But again – I have no idea how they're doing, yep. so we'll, we'll, we'll find out. But again, but... you know, thank you so much for coming on. Is there any last piece of advice that you just like for the people listening to this to hear? You know, I I think just take whatever dreams that you have and don't just dream big, but always dream bigger. That that is so important. And, you know, one of the things that I do live my life by, too, is do your best and leave the rest. And it's so hard for us to do that sometimes, you know, we because we want to do our best. We want to do even more and more and more. And you know what? There comes a time if if you put 100 percent and the way I see it is the way you do this is the way you do everything in life. And if you put 100%, that's all you can do. Let the rest of it go. You know, and, th- and that goes for your training and everything. And if you are training, trust your coach, take good notes, but also trust yourself. It's a team. Yeah, and trust me, I learned that the personally the hard way being a baseball pitcher where I could throw a one hitter and that one hit ends up being the one run that we lose one to nothing just saying, hey, I, I personally did my best. Other people might not have done their best, but, you know, I personally did all that I could do, but, you know, hey, I learned that the hard way. That's why I think team sports are so important to people because it makes you realize that, you know, you know how to get along and just do all that type sort of stuff. But again, you know, everyone go and check out Monica on her Instagram page, you know, buy or beware. Like I always say, you're going to get inspired to stop eating those Twinkies and, you know, get off that couch <laughs> and, you know, start working out. But again, Monica, as always, an absolute delight to have you on. And I, I can't I look forward already to talking to you again. Hey, it's awesome. It's always fantastic to talk to you too, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. And I I already look forward to the next time. Absolutely. Well, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone.